I love to hear how somebody spends the moments of their days. How do they organize their day so they get things done? And I especially love to hear about how someone organizes their day if it's someone that I really admire. Well, a few years ago, I studied how Charlotte Mason spent her day, how she organized the moments of her day to get things done. And it was very interesting. I wrote a blog post about that, and we'll link that for you in the description. But my friend Rochelle Baborina took it a step further. She actually tried Charlotte's schedule for 30 days. And what she's going to do today is tell you what she found out from that experience. Welcome to the Simply Charlotte Mason podcast. I'm Sonia Schaefer. Joining me today is Rochelle Baborina. Rochelle, I am so excited to hear about your experience trying Charlotte's schedule for 30 days. What prompted you to do this, by the okay. way? Well, it was in 2020 during the lockdowns. Okay. And we had a cross-country move. So yeah. first we had to get a house ready to sell, pack it up, and then move cross-country. And so I was a mess. There was no rhythm to my days, and uh, we were, I think, all suffering. And so yeah. I knew that I had to establish a rhythm and it was my son's, my, my youngest son's senior year of high school, and I really wanted to go out on a high note. Yeah, to finish strong. Mm -hmm. And I suppose when everything around you, well, as Charlotte said, the effort of decision yes. is so hard. Mm -hmm. And when everything around you is in chaos and change, you're making so many mm -hmm. decisions, and your energy is going so many directions, it would be hard to sit down and come up with your own this is right. what my day should look like. Mm -hmm. So you turned to Charlotte. <laughs> I did. So I had watched on YouTube. There's a YouTuber, uh, Nathaniel Drew, who sometimes will try a schedule for a week. Some oh. Somebody he admires, maybe Maya Angelou or Leonardo da Vinci, but he knows of that schedule. And so that kind of prompted the idea that, oh, I think I'll try Charlotte Mason's schedule for 30 days. So I took the book, um, The Story of Charlotte Mason by Essex Chumley, and I remembered that she had her, she had written about Charlotte Mason's schedule yeah. in there. And so that was my first step was taking that reading and kind of filtering that down into a daily schedule. And I was quite surprised by what I found. But what I really liked is Essex Chumley quotes Elsie Kitching, who was Charlotte's dear friend and kind of right-hand woman. And what she said about Miss Mason was, her days passed with a regularity of employment, a fullness of joy in life and work that left no room for thoughts of self. Hmm. Hmm. That's strong. <laughs> yes. Wow. And I wanted that. I wanted to be able to fulfill my duties because with the lockdowns and everything else that had been going on, I had a lot of bad habits that I had to undo, mm. like late bedtime for one. <laughs> so I had no rhythm. It was a cacophony. So did you try to follow the actual clock time table mm -hmm. that Charlotte did, like rise when she got up from yes. bed and go to bed when she went to bed and, mm -hmm. and all of that? Or was it just, I'm going to do the same routine? Yes. So I actually followed the schedule by the clock. And okay. so I had to do a deep dive to kind of even make it, you know, it, it says on her schedule that she had breakfast at eight o'clock. Yes. And so um, well, I knew she had to be doing something before that, right? She had her, her time in the Word, her, mm -hmm. her daily devotion. Um, and getting dressed right. and, you know, the usual right. stuff. Yeah. So although I didn't know what time she arose in the morning, right. I knew that her teaching students at the House of Education, they got up at 7 a.m. So that's what I use. So a lot of times I was able to fill things in based on how closely she seemed to have her routine, her daily schedule synced with her, with the House of Education, and even the um, programs, the Parents Union School programs, also that time between 9 and 1 were synced. So I could see wow. that she was eating, stu eating lunch 
with her students. Yes. She ate dinner or supper with her students as well. She breakfasted with her students. And she would read to them Yes. after that. Mm -hmm. Like I, I can still envision them still sitting around the table as she's reading. That may not right. be where they were sitting, but mm -hmm. I, that's how yes. I view it. Yeah. Yes. So this actually worked really well with the homeschool schedule. And so that's why I, I think it was so successful following the timeline. Now, now that I'm not homeschooling, I, I follow the uh, principles of her schedule, but I don't follow the same timeline. And you're not home, just to clarify, you're not homeschooling because your boys have graduated Right, now. both of my boys yes. have graduated. Yes. They're now in college. They commute, though, so I feel like I'm still doing quite a bit of, hey, Mom, would you look at this? Hey, Mom, look at my homework type yes. of a thing. Yes. So that's interesting. But with, with this, following Charlotte Mason's schedule for 30 days, I st stuck diligently to the timeline um, and even to the meal times and to the portions where I don't have the same duties as Charlotte Mason. In some ways I do because I'm a writer, and so her time spent writing, I would spend writing. So I had yeah. that time of kind of deep work, but I also got together with my son for meals and Did you read do tea aloud. time? We, so our tea time is, according to the schedule, is 4 p.m. Right. So it's not during the actual school, school But you did hours. tea time. We did tea time, and... and this was something, um, in one way, not so new to me because uh, because my in-laws are Russian, and so when they lived with us, we would have a tea time. But with Charlotte Mason, this also is important because of the way that the meals were structured. That four o'clock tea time was important to carry one over from what we call lunch, mm -hmm. what in the mm -hmm. Victorian times was called dinner, um, to the supper at 7 p.m., which wasn't until 7 p.m. Yes. All right, so we won't go through the whole schedule. Okay. Um, we'll leave a link to that so people can look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, but tell us what you learned from it. Okay. That's the main emphasis of this episode. What are some of the things you learned? So the things that I learned, and they were so helpful, and I, I really hope that people take a look at her schedule and not try to kind of slavishly follow it, but to take the principles from it and maybe incorporate them into your own lives because it's very helpful for, for your days, for your mental health, and uh, just for your closeness as a family. Yeah. So one of the things that I learned, and we always did try to have this in the house, but is to dine together together. Um, to converse together, and to continue a read aloud no matter what age your children are. Hmm, yes, because she was reading aloud to the students, and they were yes. teachers in training, mm -hmm. so already graduated high school, and yes. they were still doing read-alouds. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is to have plenty of time outdoors. So to get outside daily, now Charlotte Mason had an hour and 45 minutes daily out in nature, and... Um, we actually, because we live in northeast Tennessee, and at that time it was unbearably hot in the afternoon. Uh -huh. we, my son and I tried it for three days in a row, but it was just too hot. So we had to kind of, that was one part of the schedule we couldn't maintain. We had to have our time out of doors either in the morning or, you know, when it got uh, closer to evening. Yes, but you still spent the chunk of time. Yes. It just varied mm -hmm. according to what the weather was like, what right. the season was out there. <laughs> so a few times we did drive up to Bays Mountain, our city park, where in the forest it's much cooler. So we did that, do that at least weekly. And I think that's, if you want to, if you want to use the term permissible, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like you said, we're not mm -hmm. following it slavishly. But even Charlotte adjusted yes. as she got older and could mm -hmm. not do nature walks anymore. She would go out for nature drives. Mm -hmm. So that whole idea of adjusting and making it work for yes. you is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. definitely. So another thing is to eat healthy. And mm -hmm. this was actually probably the biggest adjustment for me with Charlotte's schedule was mealtime. So not exactly the time of the meals, but what she would have. Now, I didn't follow a Victorian diet. <laughs> I was thinking that's not really that helpful. <laughs> no, <laughs> but if you've ever heard the adage to uh, breakfast like a king, uh, have lunch like a prince, and supper like a pauper, that is how they ate. 
And so it was a very big, protein-rich breakfast. Mm. And then we had a smaller lunch. And then tea time included either a savory or a sweet. And that's what curbed that hunger. So there was no snacking throughout the day, no okay. bottomless cup of coffee. Right. So that was a big adjustment to me. Yeah. And then supper at 7 p.m. was very light. It could have been um, a le- some leftover meat or leftover fish from, from your lunch type of a okay. thing. So it was a very small, light supper. Hmm. Yeah, that was a big adjustment. <laughs> yes, but you were feeling better physically. I was. I was. And that I did continue to do. Now, there are certain times, of course, if I'm going to go out for supper for a special occasion or something like that, it won't be small. Sure, <laughs> type sure. Of a thing. Yeah. Yes. Great. What else did you discover yeah. from this? Well, um, to read widely. Yes. So Charlotte Mason had this block of time from nine basically from 9 to 1, that was where she was working. But she did take a break in Mm -hmm. that time, and she also took a reading break. And she had lots of different readings going on, and one was the news. So I don't love to read the newspaper. Um, I don't care for bad news. Um, I also don't want to stick my head in the sand like an ostrich. What I found, though, was by keeping current, though, that actually fueled my prayer time, I could pray more specifically for my city or for my state, for my country. That's a great insight. Yeah. Charlotte Mason also read satire, which is not a part of my daily reading, but it was a part of hers. So that was kind of fun to incorporate into my day was a little bit of, a little bit of satire. Um, I mean, I think that I definitely have learned that we picture Charlotte Mason as this very prim and proper Victorian, but she really had a great sense of humor. She did, yes. (laughs) So reading widely. um, And I love how um, she always had a little Scott before she went to bed, Mm -hmm. Sir Walter Scott's (laughs) novels. And from the way that is worded, that she always had a little Scott, it it, it makes me think that she would cycle through them. Yes. And so she would go back and reread mm-hmm. her favorites. It wasn't yes. always new stuff. No. And that makes me feel better because there are certain books that are like comfort food. Yes. You know, just <laughs> if I'm feeling stressed, I'm just going to go reread that book uh-huh. and it'll calm me down a little bit. Yeah. Yes. And Jane Austen was another night, could be a nightly read that she would cycle through, especially Emma. And this is one of the, <laughs> I mean, I love Jane Austen. Yes. I'm a pure Jane. And one of the things I discovered was that, uh, the act of narration, Charlotte Mason discovered that during her reading of Jane Austen's Emma. Now we're getting down a rabbit hole. I'm sorry. But <laughs> no, this is so interesting. <laughs> but one night she was reading Emma. She had insomnia. So she decided to play back in her head to try to retell the chapter of Emma that she had read. And not only did it cure her insomnia, but she that chapter really stayed with her and that is what the first ideas of narration how that came to her was by reading Jane Austen's Emma at night. So she was reading these before she ever founded the House of Education then. Correct. Because if she she incorporated narration Mm -hmm. from the very beginning of that so she made that discovery when she was very young in her teaching career. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And we find a lot of the germs of her ideas you know, happened when she was quite young. Yes. This is so fascinating. All right, what else did you discover? Oh, well, a big thing is that small minutes do add up. So Mm. uh, say she had 10 minutes of time scheduled for reading here, and then she had 20 minutes scheduled here. Well, in that 30 days, I was able to finish five books by just taking those small moments of time to read. Yes, that's... We talk about that a lot when it comes to doing short lessons with our children, that those short lessons do add up, but then applying it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. A lot of parents I know feel overwhelmed with their schedule. They don't, we don't have time to read in addition to the school work, Mm -hmm. but just 10 minutes a day, or I think it was 15 minutes once a week even can add up to is it nine hours or 13 hours 
I forget what I mm-hmm. calculated it at one point, but it's a lot of reading yes. at the end of the year. So if you do 10 minutes a day, as you said, yes. uh, 10 minutes here, 15 minutes there, I'm going to assume that you did more reading than, oh, should I go there or not? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy in the evenings mm-hmm. to think our brain is so tired we can't read. We need to just veg out oh, in front of a screen. Right. Did you find your screen time diminishing? I'm glad you did go there. So there were two things <laughs> be that gentle, I dropped. Be gentle. <laughs> <laughs> My phone was put away. I had I had the phone put away. I had like 15 minutes because I do have... I. I Schedule. I mean, I do a weekly Instagram post for Charlotte Mason Poetry. So, so there was social media. So I had a scheduled time, and I put that in my time where where she discusses mail. Um, yes, where well, she answered her mail. She answered yeah. her mail, and so I used that time. I would have fifteen minutes for social media in the morning, fifteen minutes later on in the afternoon. But then the phone was put away. I had no inane scrolling at night. Sorry, and I was reading. And um, I think that does, because those minutes add up. That's true. Right. That's very true. So the amount of work I was able to get done, I used to just hate my email because I always felt like I was drowning under email that I had to answer. Yes. And by the end of the week, just taking that short amount of time I had scheduled for email, I was completely caught up by by the end of one week. So that was, yeah, that was amazing. And... I, I remember in another place in the story of Charlotte Mason, Elsie talking about how when it was time to work, yes. she would work mm-hmm. and put everything else out of her mind. But also when it was time to take a break, she mm-hmm. would take her break and put the work out of her mind. Right. And that's so hard to do. But if you have it scheduled like mm-hmm. that... It seems like when it's always in the back of your mind, it's yes. because you haven't scheduled a time to do it. It's like, oh, yeah, don't forget. You have to get to mm-hmm. that. Don't forget. Don't forget. But if you've got it scheduled, your mind can relax and say, right. it's taken care of. Mm-hmm. It's not a problem. And this is what creates people are saying now that you can't actually have a balance, but you can. I, I will say that, that, that putting the work away at the end of your work day and then going on to your other things... Um, does create a much more healthy balance in your life, time for your family. You're going to feel feel better mentally that way. And because she was getting so much done during during her working hours because she did, she did uh, just like her students had to pay attention to their reading, she paid attention to her work in its assigned time. And then uh, she kept the Sabbath and... She called it, um, I think, that time of delicious leisure. And when you are performing your duties in the assigned time, then that definitely made the Sabbath day much more enjoyable, more relaxing. Rather Um, than nagging in the back, oh, I didn't mm -hmm. get this done, I didn't get that done. Yeah. Hmm. I also love when you said that she, she paid attention as her students did. Um, there's another passage in there where Elsie would talk about if Charlotte had a letter to answer and she wasn't sure how to answer it, she would say, we'll do this one tomorrow. But when tomorrow came, mm-hmm. Charlotte would have the answer ready to dictate. Yeah. It was like she had she thought on it mm-hmm. and she was ready for it. So she was dealing with that only once rather than, yes. you know, putting mm-hmm. it off, putting it off, putting it off for a week. Yes. And, I mean, you know, while Charlotte didn't have children of her own, she considered all of her students, her bairns and and her children, and you can really see that love uh, for them in that. And so, although she, yes, she did have a manager for the House of Education, she didn't always have that. In the beginning, she was the one mm-hmm. teaching her, her House of Education students. She was the one taking them on nature walks. She was the one... <laughs> Fixing meals, things like this. So, so, um, so I think that even though eventually she had these things in her life, her amount of responsibility expanded as yes. well. And so I think that we can take what Charlotte may we can take her schedule and those principles and apply them to our own lives. Yeah, she was overseeing thousands of children's mm-hmm. curriculum, 
choices, yes. uh, w- creating their curriculum. Um, she was overseeing uh, the monthly newsletter that was pretty thick mm-hmm. and sometimes writing for it. She was managing the teacher training college and yes. pouring into those students as well. I mean, all of that, she was, she was, had a far reaching work. Yes. And a lot of responsibility, as you said. Mm-hmm. So before we write it off as well, she didn't have kids. She doesn't know what it's like. Mm-hmm. Um, right. She had other challenges she besides was, being yes. chronically ill. Mm-hmm. And doing what we do, picking books. Yes. You know, uh, Reading them aloud. Yes, <laughs> getting the programs. <laughs> um, and she also corrected the exams yes. for all of the students. Yes. And so she had a regularity of days, but every day wasn't the same. So what else do you want to encourage our listeners with? Do you think they should try Charlotte's schedule or just take these principles? Or what are you trying to tell us here? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what to tell the viewers as far as what they're going to do with their days, um, except I would encourage them to at least have a look because, because this, the uh, schedules are all synced together between... Charlotte and her students, that it does work remarkably well for most or many homeschool families. Um, Now, uh, we all have variables. You might have a home business. Um, You might be working part-time outside of the home. Um, You might be a single parent. So, So I would take what works for you and um, but keep those principles in there as well. Eat healthy, get plenty of sleep, read widely. Um, you know, Charlotte didn't have a phone, <laughs> but she did have, she had many newspapers she could be looking at, you know, so have a healthy balance of that. Um, take meals, always have meals as a family um, in which you also converse and maybe have a read aloud after. I love it. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe and check the description for a link to Charlotte's schedule so you can see exactly what we're talking about. I hope that these principles are encouraging to you and help you as you figure out what schedule is going to work best for you and your situation. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.